motors are classified in multiple ways. We will look at only the major ways of classification. First and foremost, the criteria for classification would be the power supply. We have AC and DC motors. Second would be the basis of mounting location. We have onboard and offboard, better known as hub motors. Third would be based on rotor types, uh, like in runner where the rotor is inside the stator and out runner where the rotor is outside the stator. We'll take a deeper look at the classification based on power supply. We majorly have AC and DC motors. There's also something called as universal motor that runs on AC as well as DC, but that's a different topic altogether. DC motors are classified further as wire wound and permanent magnet DCs. We also have brush DCs, uh, which overcome the drawback of frequent maintenance and replacement of parts of DC motors by having a brushless design. This also gives the freedom to the rotor to rotate even at faster speeds as the friction losses are reduced. There are many other types uh, but don't have enough merit to find mention in automotive applications. Their characteristic curves such as torque versus RPM curves simply don't overlap with the ones demanded in the automotive application. In case of AC motors, there are majorly induction and PMSMs. Induction motor uh, so, in an induction motor, conductors are bound across the length of the rotor because these conductors are subjected to changing magnetic field courtesy the RMF, a voltage is generated inside the rotor conductor on the basis of Faraday's law. These rotor conductors are shorted to themselves at both the ends. As the circuit is complete, a current is set up in the rotor conductors. If you again invoke that if a current carrying conductor is placed in a magnetic field, it experiences a force. The series of interaction of the rotor current and the RMF results in a circular motion of the rotor. The torque of the motor is a load dependent quantity and the speed of the rotor is determined after taking into consideration the slip in the system. Slip is a phenomena observed in an induction motor. In normal operation with a load, the rotor speed always lags the magnetic field's speed allowing the rotor bars to cut magnetic lines of force and produce a useful torque. The peculiar reason for this is explained in Faraday's laws it, law itself. Faraday's law mentions that the EMF being generated in a conductor subjected to a field is dependent on the change in magnetic field. If we have constant magnetic field, EMF will not be generated. In, hypothet in a hypothetical case of a motor's rotor running at a speed equal to that of the RMF, any particular section in the rotor will not experience any change in magnetic field as there is no relative motion. Thus, no EMF will be induced and no current will flow. No motion is possible. The rotor will not experience any torque it will start to lag behind the speed of RMF. It is theoretically impossible to achieve the same speed as that of the RMF. The percentage change in the speed of the motor compared to the RMF speed expressed as a percentage is called a slip. Thus the rotor and the RMF are in a constant cat and mouse chase and Jerry always wins here as well. Back EMF. So, when the phenomenon of motoring takes place, also try to think of another phenomenon that is dynamometer. The motoring action is leading to a state where the same physical setup is acting as a generator as well. The magnetic field created by the current flowing in the rotor is interacting with the stator windings. Again, an electromotive force is set up. And according to Lenz's law, the direction or the polarity of the effect is opposite to that of the cause. Thus, the EMF induced will act to counter the flow of current in the stator. This EMF is called as back EMF. Here, I would like to address a commonly mistaken fact as well. Torque is demanded on the basis of load and current is a torque dependent quantity. Remember that current is always, always a load dependent quantity. And more importantly, a resistance can be a load, but not all loads are resistive. 
Loads in cases of motors are mechanical. They have equivalent electrical effects which are generally confused to be the load themselves. To clarify my point further, let us consider the equivalent circuit of a stator. The stator, as mentioned earlier, in a piece, is a piece of conductor wound around. The conductor will have a small ha will have some small resistance associated with it depending on its resistivity, length, and area of cross section. It will have an inductance as well, depending on the permeability of the core, number of turns, length, and area of the coil. The circuit will look somewhat like this with the equivalent resistance and inductance in series with the power source. For easier understanding, let us consider this example with one half cycle where the polarity of the power source won't be changed. At the very start of the motion, there will be no back EMF. The current will be limited only by the equivalent ser series resistance. This condition will persist only for a small duration, post which we can see the motor spinning and the back EMF being produced which is in opposite in polarity to the power supply. Now we take a snapshot of this. Now try to apply Kirchhoff's voltage law for this circuit. I decide C as my starting point and go in the clockwise direction. We have this equation where we can see how the current can vary. Now on the basis of intuition, we can relate that the magnitude of the back EMF generated will be directly proportional to the speed of the rotor. Physics might not necessarily support intuition. We also have derivation to prove my point mathematically. You can also always refer to that in the attachments. Now when load increases on the motor, the first thing to happen is a decrease in speed of the rotor. Please remember that this will be a momentary change. Because of this, the EMF decreases. That in turn means the opposition to the flow of current reduces. More current starts flowing in the circuit. Since the motoring is maintain since motor is maintaining the same speed and supply voltage is the same, as well as the extra power is now being liberated in the form of torque. We can conclude that the current is a load dependent quantity. Current is not dependent only on the resistance as is generally perceived. The resistance of the coil will remain the same barring some minor changes because of temperature dependence of resistivity. Another type of AC machine is the permanent magnet synchronous motor which have become widely adopted in EVs owing to the higher efficiency. The stator of these motors is more or less similar to those of its induction counterpart. The rotor is where a significant change in construction is observed. The windings of an electric motor are replaced by permanent magnets embedded in a core. The permanent magnets will have a certain magnetic field associated with them permanently. The RMF is set up by the stator when subjected to a three-phase supply. The RMF has a direction which will be rotating. We know the opposite poles attract and like poles repel. The stator's magnetic field and the RMF result in fields opposition poles attract each other. The rotor is locked with the RMF and will start to rotate with the same speed as that of the RMF. One can observe that the rotor is spinning in, synchron in synchronization with the RMF. Hence, this motor is called as a synchronous motor. There is no lag between the RMF and the rotor and thus there is no slip. Every manufacturer is trying to optimize its motor for performance, cost, etc. The structure is similar for most PMSM motors. Every manufacturer has its own secret recipe where the difference in the orientation of magnets and the core is observed. With the increasing advent of, for packaging in compact spaces, many advances have happened in different types of mounting of a motor. Traditionally, motors have been mounted on the chassis of the vehicle with the half shafts transmitting the torque connected by CV joints. But this can be seen as a huge waste of space in vehicles where the packaging efficiency is of great concern. Thus, another classification of motors is introduced where we have hub motors 
on one hand and the more orthodox onboard motors on the other. Motors have now been introduced as a part of the hubs itself. To simply put, the motors are part of the wheel assembly and thus take no space on the chassis of the vehicle. It is correct to assume that there will be limitations to how big and bulky the motor will be. Also, because now the motor is part of the wheel assembly, it is now an unsprung mass. It adds to the inertia and makes the vehicle less agile. E-bicycles and race cars have found a good use case for hub motors, while traditional cars, trucks and uh, even two-wheelers like scooters uh, find onboard motors. Motors are also classified on the basis of rotor position. Normally, most rotors are in runner, that is, they have their rotors on the inside part of the stator. The interaction of the flux is radial. Some motors are out runner, where the motor is on the outside of the stator. It sounds and looks strange where the rotor is out, where, where the rotor is on the outer side. A newer trend of the motor is emerging where the flux interaction is different. Traditionally, the interaction of the flux has always been radial, that is along the direction of radius of the motor, which is a cylinder. Here, the arrangement of rotor and stator is along the radius. But if we place the stator and rotor par parallelly, where they are side by side, we can get an interaction of the flux, which is axial in nature. This technology is primitive, but is gaining a lot of traction typically because of its insane power density. We can see startups like Magnax and uh, MRAX coming up with these motors.